Good evening, Bill. Good evening, Sandy. How are you? I'm fine. I've really missed you. Two whole weeks. I know. Of, oh, speaking of seeing. Too long. Two weeks too long. Hmm. Sorry, I was I was indisposed in the capital of the United States on, on, on assignment for, for speaking of seeing. Definitely on assignment. I was definitely on assignment, yeah. Mm. I did get to go to the Lincoln Memorial and read the Gettysburg Address on the wall, though, which is really quite a speech. Mm. I don't know if they teach that over there. Do they teach the Gettysburg Address over there? No. I'll well, if they do, I don't, I don't know. Yeah, it's, a, it's quite a speech. At a time when people used to do two or three hours of oratory, he got up and spoke like 143 words and then walked off the stage. So the person who was supposed to be there to take a photograph of the event only got a picture of him walking down off the stage because mm -hmm. he went too fast. Yeah, but it's like one of the best speeches ever. Anyway, go ahead. Well, this evening, a person, a woman, the person is a woman. That's our conversation tonight. Okay. We were talking just before we started. Do you think broadly you know much about the not so vast archive of uh, female work in photography? Um, I think that I know the heavy hitters that most photographers would know. Yeah. I'm sure there are vast, you know, swaths of photographers that I don't know, but I'd be willing to bet that most photographers who don't specifically look to follow more obscure, if not important photographers also don't know them though, you know? Mm. Like I probably know more than your average person, but not certainly enough, you know? Well, I mean, I've got three big hitters. Yeah. But all, um, all different, quite different really in their kind of conceptual underpinning. And that can be deceptive. Um, is, is it fair then, before we start, is it fair to connect them by their gender if there's not much else to connect them by? Well, this is something that comes up a lot just generally about life, I think, is how um, the, there's, you know, equalitarianism ought to allow for there not to be a kind of deliberate lean into gender. Right. We we don't uh, put Van Gogh and Picasso together just because they're two men. You know? No, yeah. but I do in these photographs. So we've only got three this evening because obviously lots of you realize Bill and I are trying to cut down our conversation. <laughs> We're very, you know, we're very good at a lot of things, Sandy. I don't think that's one of them. No. So we've got three images. And I think it is right to perhaps talk about being a woman in these photographs. Okay. Anyway, we shall begin with Francesca Whitburn. Yeah. So in her very short career. Yeah, how, what, how old was she when she died? Um, 22. She took her own life, as I recall. Mm -hmm. So she was uh, very, I, I mean, she came from a very cultured background. Um, both parents were heavily involved in the, the art scene and the art world. Mum was a a sculptor, I think. Dad was a photographer and a painter. He taught photography, lectured in photography. Um, Francesca Woodman was very used to being around art, visual art, and kind of the discourse about art. She was used to meeting artists. Lots of very established and very famous artists would come round, call for, for dinner at the Woodman's house. She herself went to the Rhode Island School of Design. She was kind of no stranger to the, the language of visual art and its kind of conventions and its codes. Um, she studied, uh, you know, she would have studied even things like uh, 
classical painting, Renaissance painting, and very early Renaissance painting, such as Giotto, I think was a real fascination of hers. And she spent a year in Ro uh, Rome as part of the Rhode Island, I don't know, like a kind of exchange program or something. Yeah, and she you, actually- You can refer to it as RISD, by the way. That's what all the cool kids do. Well, as you know, I'm not cool. So I shall keep calling it the Rhode Island School of Design. Um, but she took a lot of her um, uh, very famous photographs when she was in Rome or in Italy, certainly. Her family had a holiday home in Tuscany somewhere, but this was her independent for a year. Um, when I was thinking about, about this presentation and, and what it was really about, um, you know, the person, a woman, was a last minute change. It was actually originally the past, a person. Okay. Um, and that's because there's an element of hindsight that, that adds another layer to all of the work we're going to look at. Um, and, and what I mean by that is, we know that Woodman took her own life at 22 and it's become kind of like the legend of her, part of her mythology. Yep. Um, and I think sometimes that gets in the way maybe of what, when she made these photographs, she could have intended. And that's because we want to perhaps rush in and psychoanalyze her work in context then of her suicide. Um, do, do you think that people tend to, especially with somebody like her, tend to overanalyze it? Okay, the amount of images that she made, who knows, it's probably in the hundreds, right? You know, it took 800, around 800 that yeah. we would know of as, as okay. part of the kind of opus of her career. Yeah, and career being, you know, six years or whatever it is, you know what I mean? Not mm. a very long amount of time because yeah. she was so young when she died. That there's a, I don't know, similar to the way that people talk about all kinds of artists who die very young, that that there is a instant enigmatic quality to the work that remains mm. because there's so little of it, that, that it leaves so many questions unanswered that people tend to fill it, imbue it with maybe even more importance than it would have if the person lived until the 80 and this was just the first six years of their career? Well, this is what I'm talking about with our kind of sense of, of looking backwards at this. Yeah. You know, in 1978, when she was in Rome, she took her own life in 1981. You know, did she, did she make work that was kind of tantamount to suicide? No. Maybe we don't have to say that. Maybe yes, everything in her life led to the point at which she did choose to take her own life. But nonetheless, when she was making this kind of imagery, it is loaded, it is highly symbolic, but it is also about not something separate to her death, because I don't really believe that anything is separate to anything else in one's life. But certainly there is a, a weightiness to her um, femaleness, I think, looking at her, looking at her photographs. And also, this is in context of, of the time frame in which she was photographing in the 70s, a kind of um, emancipatory uh, sense of, of womanliness, or emerging womanliness, at the same time as there being this significant sense of there needing to be an erasure of that female, which gives it a really fascinating duality in all her photographs. And, and you know, Woodman's work is really well documented. I'm not going to say anything that's uh, new, I don't suppose, uh, <laughs> about her work, but I do think it's so uh, mesmerizing and I think it's also extraordinarily feminine. Two things. One, almost every fem art, art sort of artistic female photographer that I know lists her as one of their biggest uh, 
I don't know. I would, I would say, I, I'm going to go out on a limb and say most of the artistic female photographers that I know are so into Woodman that they, I would use the word fetishize her. Mm. Um, I don't know, it, as lovely as her work is, and I think it's great, I don't know any men who fetishize her work. So I think it's interesting from like even a gender point of view, what women seem to get out of her work and what men seem to get out of her work. Well, I don't, are, think, either of us, I don't think either of us ought to move ourselves into our positions as genders necessarily now, but I can no, say I, but, that- you, you see know, what I'm getting at though? I, I do, yeah. but I also, I also see that one doesn't have to be female to recognize femaleness, of course. No, yeah, absolutely. Um, and also, I, I would just like to mention, as an aside, you know, the majority of people we talk about do tend to be male. Yep. That's not, that's not necessarily the fault of any of those photographers, of course. Yep. But um, I grew up in a world where I was inspired to be a photographer and then a teacher through looking at art that was delivered to me by men, mostly. And I had to teach myself uh, about, the, about what else was available you know, I think about this particularly, the kind of work that I like as a, as a kind of rule. I'm, I'm guaranteed to like usually large color photographs of, um, you know, interiors. And I was just really fortunate, perhaps, that in that oeuvre, there were lots of photographers for me as a, as a young female photographer to look up to. It is really difficult. I don't want to say it was because Candida Hoffer is a woman, I really like Candida Hoffer. I don't want to say because Lynn Cohen is a woman, I really like Lynn Cohen. I don't want to say that Uta Barth is one of my favorite photographers ever because she's a woman. But maybe there is something in that. Uh, I think especially for an aspiring photographer, very young. Okay, you, because you up, know that those photographers are women or because you had a connection to the work before you even knew who made it? I had, a connection, I had a connection to the work before I knew who had made it, but it was also very powerful for me in the sort of, you know, 90s in, in Glasgow, looking out into a world and, and thinking that there were people, oh, it's so simple, isn't it? Simply that there were people like me who were making excellent work, brilliant work, transporting work. They were able to do it. Anyway, that's that's kind of an aside and look the look but, but, ourselves about it really, but but I think there's also an element to it where, in a lot of ways, because she takes you know photos of herself, mm. and she is a very idealized female form in a lot of ways. She's a beautiful woman who, you know, I, I can imagine a lot of women identifying with her because she does embody a lot of femininity in just her way. You know what I'm saying? Like in her, her, her style and the way she even looks in a lot of the photographs. I think there's a, there's a, um, I think there's a, I wish I could be her in this photograph element to a lot of the work. And I think a lot of the way, a lot of my female photographer friends see her in those images, like they want to be her. See, I, I mean, I, I do usually see, um, truthfully, I do see sadness in a lot of her work and this idea I said already about erasure, the sense that yeah. the presence of the, of the person is rubbed away by time um, and by light, and by movement. All those things, of course, are connected and really the same. Um, and why do you see that? I don't quite understand that point. I think it's because in so much of her work, she has moved herself enough so that we only feel her presence through the suggestion of her form and yes we do know her form because she took a lot of 
photographs and in many of them she is still enough to be captured usually in her nude form and that nude form is classically beautiful to do with like a beauty yeah. standard that we are mm -hmm. used to um, and I, i'd also like to say somewhat timeless 20th century like this picture could have been taken in 1938 and it would look almost the same there's a lot of, of her pictures aren't specifically late 70s you know Yes, and also, I mean, she would have been very aware of the carotid, um stone carvings of, you know, women draped in, in very kind yeah. of classical. She's playing off of all of that. Yeah. yeah, she is. And uh, all these things are counterpoints. I said before about the sense of, um, you know, there's like a du duality in a lot of her photographs. We're looking at something that's classically beautiful, yet we're looking at something that defies the conventions of beauty. We're looking at something that's timeless, and yet that by its very nature speaks to us of time. Uh, a photograph speaks to us of time in its essence always anyway. Um, but the fact is that in a lot of her work, this particular image, self-deceit, you and I have spoken before about the value of title um, the presence of the mirror, the fact that she's, we still don't get a complete purchase on her. Do you ever notice that in her photographs? Yeah. Is even when we do see her very beautiful nude form, we don't get full, we don't get full purchase ever. Yeah, you, you're, it's, to, to put it in a, in a more vulgar parlance, she's a bit of a tease the way she like, places herself she's not she's never she's You're never deliberately provocative there bill no I'm, I'm not I'm, I'm not trying I don't mean it in a sexual way necessarily I just mean that like she's like she's always like one move away from actually showing herself to you not sexually not like body parts way I just mean that like it's always like wait what does she actually look like like it's always like one step away from you like you you could walk by her on the street and you wouldn't even know who she was because you don't really know what she looks like in a lot of those pictures you know? hmm. um but this is why, also, this is why yeah. i think she does belong when i eventually got round to naming this presentation i think it's why she perhaps does belong to the person a woman um because much as i might rally against that your your use of um language and description there is, is really about uh, a common traditional perception of a woman who, of, of a woman who, who shows something but holds something back, somebody who displays something, but somebody who hides, somebody who- You don't think that's what she's doing? I think she's fully aware of that, fully aware of that. Well, what I'm interested in, and I, I haven't ever read, and somebody very smart, maybe watching, might know and would be able to write as a, you know, a comment about this. But you know, Woodman, I do know that Woodman was was very well educated. She came from a family in which art would have been discussed all the time. She was in Rome for a year. She was a, 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 an art graduate. She was used to the language of visual art. Was this about being a provocateur as a woman, or was this about playing with kind of artistic tropes? Couldn't it be both? Maybe. I don't know. I don't know. If, I don't know if that's something that anybody knows, or that you know she ever talked about. Maybe she did. I just haven't. I haven't found it. I haven't read it. I. I, I think. I think part of it too with her specifically is that she feels like so much of a mystery just because she wasn't old enough to actually, she was sort of discovered after her death, right? In a lot of ways. So it's it's not like we have a lot of interviews with her where she's discussing this stuff at a high level, you know, um, or, on, uh, you know, in long form, as far as I know. I, I, I mean, she know, was exhibiting, wrong. you know, in her lifetime, she was exhibiting. Yeah, but I, it's, but I, it's like the kind of conversations that come out from, having a career for 20 years and giving a lot of interviews and that kind of stuff, you know, it's like, a, it's like a different conversation and a different way of describing your own work. Mm -hmm. I also think it's interesting. I mean, 
the whole self-portrait element of all of this, right? Is, you know, would this photograph be different if this was just some model that she met in Rome versus herself? Like, well, well she, and sometimes she did use she did use other models, but they did tend to look quite like her. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, right. She was obviously even taking she was taking self portraits even when she was taking portraits. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. I mean, because so does that change the way you see it? Identifying her as the person in the photograph as the artist on top of identifying with the artist. Does that make sense? Yeah, again, I just want to come back to the sense of title for the, for our presentation even. Sure. You know, all of the photographs I'm, I'm showing tonight are self-portraits. Yep. So the other one was the person, the self. <laughs> you know, I went through really lots of iterations about this tonight because, you know... Was it always the, th the was it always three female photographers when you were going to call it the other thing? No, I tell you who I, who I did have to begin with. I had... Um, because I was interested in the idea of like how we project backwards with what we know to, to you know, in, in Woodman's case, we psychoanalyze it. We think everything is about her suicide. Um, by, by the way, I, I, was, I, I, was, I, I don't. I think the whole thing is much simpler, but yes, I understand that a lot of people do, you know, play it on the suicide. Oh yeah, they or. pack it up like a little pack horse. That that's what it's about. But the I other think she person, was a young girl who was very, she knew a lot of art. She lived in the art world. She knew she was beautiful. She was making fun art, but she was also depressed and killed herself. I don't think, I don't think it's nearly as deep as some people make it out to be. Mm, I, I would argue with you that it's not deep. However, the other person I did have in this completely, yeah. you might think of as being completely different was actually Rembrandt. <laughs> oh, interesting. Uh, okay. I paired Woodman with Rembrandt. Um, and that was to do with how one makes self-portraiture not as self-portraiture, but as experiment. And one makes self-portraiture as experiment that they don't call self-portraiture. And actually, when I then tried to think my way out of how I would ever talk about that, I didn't think we'd be able to manage it in under an hour. So, um... <laughs> okay, speak for yourself, sister. <laughs> He did a lovely job just then. Go ahead. No, it's good. Well, no, the reason why, why Rembrandt came into this is that, I mean, eventually he was cut out <laughs> because he's a lowly male. But really, it was because um, his inclusion to begin with was, you know, obviously he painted himself throughout his entire life. You know, we have got the most extraordinary view, overview of Rembrandt from being a very young man right up until the year he died. Um, because he painted a portrait of himself frequently. Um, and, you know, if you, you know, there are quite a, couple, a few sites are sort of devoted to just cataloging him as he aged. You could almost do a kind of animation of him aging through the age. Uh, and I thought it was interesting that somebody would, would do that. But though Woodman's life was very, very short, the fact is, is that in those 800 photographs of her career, she was just recording herself. Um, anyway, I think some people, though, to, to, to be a contrarian, some people use themselves because they don't trust others or don't have anybody else. It's not necessarily, you know, some sort of self congratulatory or, you know, I don't know how else to put it. You understand what I'm getting at, though. I do. And I think, you know, in teaching, I'm saying all the time that when we photograph people, well, you know, you're always with yourself. Yep. I don't know. Have you ever made uh, self-portraits, Bill? A handful. Hmm. But do you share them? Uh, I have. I haven't taken any in a long time. I generally, I have a hard time taking self-portraits, uh, both because I don't like the way I look in photographs and um, the technical aspects of it are complicated. Basically, focus is complicated, you know. Oh, such a boring. I, 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 well, I would never also, I would never do conceptual photos of myself. That just seems weird to me. It feels self-indulgent, you know, in a way. Is this, this is the problem with. Is this. Oh, yes, very much so. Yeah, absolutely. But you're also talking to, you know, a New Englander from America. Like, 
I think having a bedroom twice the size of your bed is self-indulgent. So like, you know, I just, I, I just, I live in a very, that's why I don't really like talking about myself all that much because it feels self-congratulatory, you know? Um, yeah, I, I, yeah, I do. Um, but, but, it's, it's not to say that it's wrong or bad. I think her photographs are lovely, always have, but it's not the kind of work that I make. So I don't, I don't usually use her as a, an example of one of my, um, you know, one of my influences just because I don't make work like this. But if I made work like this, she would definitely be on the list, you know? Mm. I would definitely count Woodman as one of my influences. And, and I did make In work. Your architectural photography? No, I did. You did make work like this. I did make work like this. Well, how come I never see this work? <laughs> when I, but probably when I was about the same kind of age. Oh, you got to pull out those archives. I got to see this stuff. I don't think so, Bill. Um, <sighs> no trust. No, none. But <laughs> I, I must, I must be very careful not to assume that my motivation was her motivation, and yet if I were her. I would make these photographs too. What was your motivation? Um, actually, very similar to what we were just saying. Uh, I didn't have a very wide circle of people to to work with, but I, I had my own body, I had myself. And sure. I mean, actually, a lot of Woodman's work is, re is really interesting to me architecturally. Um, the interior spaces that she shoots in. She actually was photographing when she was in Italy. Someone took her to a disused pasta factory and that's where she made a lot of these photographs because she had this kind of free reign in this vast cavernous space that was just yeah. abandoned. Um, you, was, I mean, do you also think there's an element too of, I'm sorry to cut you off just quickly because I don't want to lose my chance of thought. Do you think that there's an element to like, she was an attractive person. You're an attractive woman. Maplethorpe did self-portraits. He thought he was really attractive. Like, do you think that there's also an element of, of people, artists who are attractive making self-portraits that it's a, that it's something of a, I know I would look good in photos. So I will take photos of myself element. Bill, do you think I'm pretty? Very much so. You're a lovely woman. <laughs> But you know what I mean? Like you must have known when you were 19 years old that you were an attractive woman. But like, so, I mean, I'm just saying like, do you think there's an element of that in all of it? Um... Like a little bit of like a show off element to it all. Uh, everything is an answer with a kind of long winded answer. I'm really sorry, but uh, I would say that when I made photographs like this, I didn't really show them to anyone. Okay. Uh, so maybe that's different again. You know, Woodman was exhibiting this work. In fact, she went in Italy, she had an exhibition, um, maybe several, but definitely one that I know of in which she showed work like this. Um, so I think that that ties in a kind of in, in a sense of intention. It does lead me into this actually. You know, yep. Vivian Meyer. Took lots of self portraits and no one ever saw them. Had, had no intention of ever showing these photographs to anyone. Right. Now, there are lots of things about Vivian Meyer that are really endlessly interesting. One of them is that she was a woman in the 1950s working as a, a nanny who really, I guess, defied conventions, maybe. She did a lot of things that could be expected. She was unmarried. She was working class. She didn't have her own children. So she was kind of like in service, I suppose. And yet, I'm sure when you look at her photographs, you you get a sense of her. I mean, my sense of her is that she's resolute in her uniqueness. And she's not beholden really to anybody. 
Our photographs make her into an observer, but she was not just an observer. She was an actual experiencer. Um, and she really challenges a stereotype of 1950s women, I think. All, all while doing it in such a way that it could very well have never been seen by anybody. I mean, there's, there's a kind of morality in this as well, which is that, should we see her photographs? I mean, I'm yeah, glad I mean, we do. I've, I've, I mean, I've had that conversation before. I, I personally, you know, there was a conversation I once had. There was a, a, a poet and an artist, who was it? Some writer who in their will put a thing that after their death, all of their papers would be burned and destroyed so mm -hmm. that they would never be seen by any sort of academics or whatever it is, or some famous writer. And I, I thought that that was very wrong, personally. I mean, like, do they have the right to do that? I guess so, but it just, it felt, it's like, you're dead. If some person who's studying your work can, can find something out about what you're writing or your process or, or figure out something about themselves and their work by reading some of your stuff in progress or notes that you wrote or something like give back to humanity. Like, I feel like that's, you don't lose anything by showing how you got to the, got to the, the end zone, you know? Um, Is that and, because you make so, an assumption that everybody makes work to make their voice public? No, I, I, I think I think that my point is more that, you know, you are one of a group of humans and you don't lose anything after death in sharing yourself with other humans. Like, so why would you destroy the stuff you made just to make a, like, it just feels weird to me. I, it could be that they were embarrassed by it because they all thought it was crap, you know, which is, fine but like you're not here to be embarrassed you're dead so who do you you know what do you care in, that, in i think my, that's in, making a i think that's making a a, a gross what? assumption bill about what's the assumption well I, th I think actually the assumption is about how people have faith in in what life and death actually mean okay fair enough but i i in in this case she took these photographs she did not destroy them mm. So therefore, the fact that they were found after her death, should some guy have made money publishing them? Well, that I have a problem with. But I've always had a problem with this whole story from, from that point of view. Mm -hmm. But yeah, do I have a problem with seeing these pictures? Like I'm looking at somebody's diary or something? No, not at all. But also, I mean, the kind of parity between she and Woodman is maybe not obvious. Yes, we could say, oh, well, they're both black and white photographs of ladies that they took themselves. But there's also this sense of um, being now and looking back at them and al almost kind of tarnishing them with our experience of knowing them now when the intention of the photographs is maybe very different to what we see. And I wonder how much uh, space we give in our understanding of work to, to really ever consider what the, the, the maker actually intended or wanted. I mean, Woodman perhaps wanted, wanted to explore her maybe um, identity, female identity, by allowing us glimpses of classic beauty and yet allowing us no firm grasp of that form. Meyer is not doing that, but she is giving us a window into a life, but she's not giving it to us. And I, I think, you know, why was she making the photographs? Well, you're also, you're discounting a whole bunch of stuff, I mm -hmm. think. I mean, there's also the, the question of maybe she just didn't think her work was good enough that anybody else would care. It might not have been that she was keeping it private. She just didn't think it was necessarily worthy of being public. It could be that, you know, she said to herself, I live this drab life being nannies to all these other rich people's kids. And the one thing I have to do with myself is like, oh, it'd be fun to actually just carry a camera around and take pictures. Turns out 
a number of them are excellent, extraordinary pictures. Mm -hmm. It's it, it doesn't need to be that deep, and it doesn't need to be, it doesn't need to be as like full of subterfuge, right? It could just be no. I, I, I don't know. She was taking pictures and she threw them in a drawer because she just never thought that they were any good, and it had nothing to do with her her I would, desires. I would you know? kind of align with that thinking if she had maybe taken a few rolls every month. You know, but th this is somebody who was kind of obsessively photographing. Yeah. And, and a, but just a because somebody's OCD and obsessive doesn't mean that, you know, it has any other deeper meaning. Is there any deeper meaning? I, I find it, no. I, I will tell you, this is like, this is going to be a really, as I get older, because I'm old. Well, I'm 46. <laughs> 37, I'm not old. Um, <laughs> that I I just I I I think about somebody who's 19 years old when this woman took this picture. Mm -hmm. I don't know many 19 year olds who are actually fully like you're 19. You know nothing when you're 19. So like to think that somebody who's 18 or 19 years old are thinking like I'm just saying that you're. Hang on, you're, wait you're a still, second. You're still a child when you're 18 or 19 years old mentally. Seriously, like I not 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 to say that you don't come up with good stuff or or have good thoughts or whatever it is, but like you're still you're still you're still cooking at eighteen or nineteen years old. You're still well, figuring out who you I'm are. gonna say that you know I'm still cooking in my forties now. I have. That's what I'm saying. Yes, I know, but what it means it doesn't disqualify what I make I'm now. Disqualifying it now, I'll be you know I'll be no, looking back I, at my forty something self thinking well, I knew nothing. Absolutely. But what I'm saying is that I, I don't think that if, if Woodman had lived until 60 and she read the things that she wrote when she was 19, I think she'd be like, oh my God, I was so self-indulgent or whatever. You know what I mean? Like I was, I was so emo because I was 19 and still had all kinds of crazy hormones going through my brain or all these kinds of things that, that that's just a reality of being young and I think sometimes we give a, a an emotional depth to those to to people to people that age that I don't know that I, I think sometimes that depth is a little bit of a mirage because if because if you feel so even if that were the case age, even if yeah. that were the case it doesn't discount that. The work produced in those very fertile years when one is accelerating through experience. You know, yep. what an amazing and extraordinary time of life to be making any work. Sure. What an amazing and extraordinary time of life to be making work actually as a, as a young woman in the 70s who is playing around, I think, with our ideals of femaleness, femininity, beauty, um, limitations of those things. I don't think this is shallow. I'm not saying it's shallow. I also don't think though that somebody who dies at 22 lived a life that is the full depth of somebody who lived until they're 85. I feel like some people look at people who die young and they imagine that their life of 21, 22 years was like basically a full life packed into 22 intense tortuous years yeah. and i think sometimes that's 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 a way for us to um i don't know magnify the importance of the work that they made during those during that time because they died young it's still the entirety of a life though isn't it yeah okay what if she died when she was 11 and she took 12 pictures on on her mom's instamatic would that mean that she lived a full life at age 12? Of course not. I think we are fundamentally so very different, Bill. I mean, I, I, I look at all the people, famous people who died at 27, you know, and I think, oh, my God. Like, Kurt Cobain knew nothing. He was 27 years old, you know. And we, we act like he's an old sage. He was just like, no, he was, he was still a child in a lot of ways, you know, it's, it's sad and awful that he was in such pain and depression and he killed himself, but that doesn't give 
the pain that he felt deeper meaning because he was young when he died. You know what I mean? You can disagree. I do disagree. Um, <laughs> Wait a minute. Hold on a second. How do we get back to Woodman? Go forward. You're, right. you're jumping backward. This yeah, is yeah, I know. This is, okay, this so, is how we talk for four hours. Go ahead. I know. Right. Vivian Meyer, though, you mm -hmm. know, we're looking at somebody who did not intend her work to be seen. In fact, she maybe didn't even think of her photographs as work. Right. And and how old was she when she died? I mean, she died in 2009. She was, she was an old lady. She's old born woman, in 1930 yeah. something. Um, yeah. Oh no, I think she was born in 1926. Yes, yeah, she was. So, you know, she wasn't, she didn't die prematurely. No, she, she lived a long full life, yes. Uh, she, she is just like this rogue element. Now, again, I want to come back to this idea that, you know, the person, a woman, she is kind of set up in her shop now for us to consume her work. And there is a bit of kind of discourse and dialogue about, you know, the fact that she, as I've already said, she challenged conventions of what it would mean to be a woman, a stereotypical woman of the 1950s would be married with children. She would be uh, dependent on a husband. It was the, the age, the post-war age of, um, you know, appliances and, you know, without putting a kind of madman spin on this, actually that would have been the life she was peripheral to. Sure. Because she was looking after the children of those kinds of people. Yeah, yeah. That she most likely chose not to live that life, yeah. And yet she, you know, I do wonder with her if she chose to work there because she wanted to glean something from it that was not just about earning money, that was actually about experiencing by proxy. I don't mean to fill the void of being husbandless. I mean, because it was so fascinating <laughs> to her that anyone should okay. want or need those things. I think I think that I think that could be. I think it also could be though that you know it was a reasonable way to make a living for a single woman at the time, you know. That was an acceptable job that you know. Something I do find interesting though is that there are a lot of self-portraits in her work. Yep, a lot of them. Um and sometimes she's there uh in in this one where she was fully aware she was making a, she was making a self portrait. Yes. So she was seeing her reflection in a window. There's a lot there, of photographs like that. In my a lot of photographs. Her. I mean, there are also lots of photographs where she features, but where I would say that she probably isn't making a self portrait. She just happens to be in the frame because of something that's mirrored or reflecting her back. But nonetheless, I think that, that, that's that's her big shtick. I think is 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 that whole that whole thing. Yeah, yeah and most but, of the, her best images actually have that element, but go ahead. Well, um, it's kind of uh, linking in really to, to look at what you were saying earlier again about Woodman. You know, Woodman, this young, beautiful, um, kind of standard issue, classical beauty, taking photographs because she, she knew that she looked good. Well, mm -hmm. this is not what's happening here. Why was she taking the self-portraits? I don't think people take self-portraits because they think they look great. Very rarely. Sometimes they do. I, I, I think I that think so. I, I think that she. Although it's funny because, like, I don't look at Vivian Meyer and not think that she's attractive in a classical way. I think she's pretty cool looking. Um, how many? Wait, how many? She did shoot a lot. Is there any idea of how many images that she shot over her life? Um, how many I'm, they found? Uh, well he found in that trunk at the yard sale or whatever it was, it was or whatever his name was what's the guy's name i don't know i mean go and watch if you're if you're listening to this and you are interested in in vivian meyer i mean the the documentary is called finding vivian meyer um and actually the Do you person, like that documentary um i want to say yes yeah i found it very yeah. self-indulgent yeah i'm not sure <laughs> Uh, I think, you know, what's interesting is that we do have a, a, a sequence quite close to the beginning of that where he does lay out everything that he, he, he found of hers. Yeah. 
and um, that included not just her photographic archive but also other various possessions and I found that whole thing um, well again there's lots of things you've already said Bill about this it's like um, Wait, did you some, agree with? Uh, no. <laughs> somebody has the right to say before they die that when they die they don't want anything of themselves shared well you know did she give anyone any right I don't think she did in fact I actually think she rather said she didn't want people to see her photographs I'm sure there is something about that I might be wrong yet here we are watching as a woman a woman's life is unpacked now we pick over lives in photographs we see things and because we see them we think we have some kind of um connection to them or with them. And often we also believe that because we've consumed them visually, that perhaps we can have, have a, a right to them. Uh, this is in a different context to the right to photograph that we were talking about the other day, actually. It's like, as the viewer, we feel we have a right to things that we see. But actually, I wonder how many of us pause to think, you know, we're looking at something that wasn't intended to be seen. Should we be looking? Uh, I mean, I think that that certainly changes. If, if let's say she took all these pictures not intending anybody to ever see them, like she really didn't want anybody to see them. It actually gives you some really interesting insight into her psyche, just because, you know, you're looking at something that she was Hang seeing on, that Bill. she wanted to record. Yes. Are you psychoanalyzing Vivian Meyer? Yeah, just for half a second. Don't worry, I'll. I'll but you snap don't do it with Francesca Woodman. No, because I think she is wearing what she's trying to do on her sleeve, in a way that Vivian Meyer is not. Ooh, interesting. Yeah, uh, I would also like to say though. I mean, let's say Meyer shot thousands of rolls of of film, right? Yeah. Does it matter to you? It's it's similar to like the the classic Robert Frank thing of the Americans, right? It's like mm. whatever. 38 photographs in the Americans or 80 or whatever the heck it is. And the guy shot 800 rolls during that trip. Mm -hmm. If any of us shot 800 rolls, we could pull out 28 images that are pretty cool. So is, is there a ratio thing to you that, that, that if Vivian Meyer shot a roll of film every single day of her life. And so she had, you know, 4 million frames and you pull out 200 photographs that are extraordinary. Is that really, does that show that she's a good photographer or does it just show that she took so many photographs that some of them are going to be exceptional? Do you, do, I mean, do you ever think about that when you think about an artist? Like, okay, they, they made a thousand paintings but only six of them are good versus, you know what I mean? It, does, does sort of the, 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 the um, I don't know, the, the, the ratio of quality of their work change how you see their work at all? Well, obviously, it's a particular concern for photographers. Mm, and again, it's a particular concern for photographers now because the capacity to shoot so much. Yeah, I mean, you just, uh, just keep shooting until you get something good, you know. And again, from a teaching perspective, it's something that I really rally against. Sure. You, you know, it's just like pages and pages and pages of thumbnails. Well, of, I course, had, I had a, of course, you've got a I good had, picture, Matt. Yeah, I had a conversation with the... I went to the Apple store the other day to look at a ridiculously expensive monitor. And I was talking to the guy who was showing it to me. And he was this like younger guy who says he just bought a Canon 5D Mark II. And uh, last year, because he, he, was a, he was a younger black gentleman and he was really turned on by the George Floyd protests in New York and stuff last year. And he started going to the protests and shooting the protests. Mm -hmm. And he was, he was saying that he shot, I forget, I said, how many pictures do you shoot when you go out there? And Because he was asking me about some picture I took, because I it was showing him some of my work. And I said, you know, I was just in DC for shooting for a magazine. I shot three people in one day, and I shot maybe 500 images total. I said, you probably shoot 500 images in an hour if you're out there shooting a protest. He's like, oh, yeah, easy. And I was like, that's just such a different way, like a completely different way of thinking about. But it's not, it's, it's not just, um, diminishing in any way 
that process because actually that's no. just time consuming, isn't it? Time it is, consuming in a different way. At a certain point, you could shoot video and just pull a frame out of it every once in a while. You know what I mean? That was like the right moment. But it does it does question whether part of a photographer's job is to know when to shoot and when not to shoot. And I think the photographer's so, okay, job yeah. is when to see and when not to see. Okay, but I, I'm sure we could all pull lots of pictures by Vivian Mayer that are really terrible photographs because everyone takes really terrible photographs. So I just, I just in, a, in a lifetime, we talk about her as this amazing photographer and a lot of her work is amazing. Mm -hmm. But like, do we take into, do we, are we supposed to only make those judgments based upon the best of somebody's work or does their entire body of work matter? Hmm. I don't know. It's just, you know, I, I just a thought. It's off topic, but it's a thought. Maybe it's not off topic though. Maybe it's relevant to, to talk about it in this context of, of being a female photographer in the 1950s. That there was well, a I mean, allowance right. that, that, you know, she was there very much as a, she was a, a diarist. She was probably ignored a lot of times. While well, she yes. I mean, there's a lot of stuff about her kind of invisibility that is extraordinarily poignant. Yeah. And really interesting. And again, this is, uh, you know, the title. It is her invisibility, her ability to be invisible. And part of that was to do with the fact that she was perhaps a rather ordinary looking unmarried woman and she was just like you know when does when does a person when is a person a person of value is raised by this because when is a woman a person of value I don't want to to go into that too much and how, but, well and how many people are raised up and thought of as important just because I don't know they have rich parents and they're a guy or they're white or, or, you know, I mean, any, any combination of those things that, and they're just, you know, a waste of time. Yeah. I sort of feel like Cindy Sherman is maybe somehow a little bit of what you'd get if you took the ingredients from Woodman and something stylistic from Vivian Meyer, only in the only in the film still series really, but this is a masterclass in um, the high visibility of the invisible woman. The high visibility of the invisible woman. All of these women are either somehow invisible, or making themselves invisible being an observer photographically doesn't mean that you have to be invisible. However, I wonder about their visibility on, on all levels. I mean, this is like so multi-leveled here. They're visible because they're beautiful or they're not. They're visible because they're married or they're not. They're visible because they're women or they're not. They're visible because the photographs they take have an audience or not. And then you have somebody like Sherman who is playing on all that, but on top of that is playing roles in especially these early self-portraits where not that she's trying to blend into the picture, but she's trying to be innocuous in the photograph a lot of times. You know mm. what I mean? Like she's not looking at the camera, I don't think ever in any of those early ones. So there is this sort of, there's oh, a really, I just, uh, there's a brilliant sort of a, a moment captured, you know? Yeah. yeah, I mean, to her work, I mean, just before this series, like 1975, she was shooting kind of like um, quite kind of Warholian photo booth self-portraits where she was, other people and um i think it's kind of testament to this this play a, a play on a play on gender a play on invisibility i don't know if that invisibility or visibility is to do with gender really um somebody you know maybe more scholarly 
would I think you could have done an equally successful series of a guy who's I don't know a a cab driver and a doorman and a postal worker who's invisible and shots in the same kind of way yeah I but it's as with everything this is also nuanced and part of that nuance is to do with gender of course I mean Sherman's film stills do of course hark back to the era in which Maya was actually photographing um I kind of do you like this series I love it for what it gives us uh, um conceptually okay It's just, I, I feel the same way about, say, Warhol, where it's like, I like Warhol's work for the conversation around Warhol's work. I don't particularly like looking at Warhol's work. Um, yeah, I mean, there's also a sense with Sherman that, you know, again, like Woodman, we don't get full purchase on her, although we know very much what she looks like. We don't know what she looks like. Um, do you think she's ambiguous looking anyway, or do you think she creates that ambiguity? I mean, cause she can be very sort of like even androgynous in the way that she styles herself within the sphere of femaleness, you know what I mean? I mean, her whole game is being a chameleon. Are, are we all the chameleons? Uh, Ooh, you know, I don't, I don't want to fight about this, but yeah, you know, she's invisible. Her her currency was that she was invisible so often. That's why it's so fascinating that she made all these self portraits. It's like an affirmation that she actually existed. Yeah, for herself. Woodman is, I mean, here explicitly using a mirror, but. Often, again, this this word erasure, and actually even in reading articles about Woodman, you often see the word erasure. She was wiping out something of herself, even though she was giving us her, her nude body, even though she was giving us a sense often, I think, of um, intimacy. Yeah. Uh, there's like a presence and an absence in all of them. And again, the idea of the, the, the female as being present and absent is something that's that's so relevant for us to look at and talk about. Mm. And I started out earlier talking about, and you brought it up quite rightly, you know, is there any place really for us to talk about women photographers? And frankly, that does start to grate and piss me off, as I'm, I think it does with you as well. It's like, well, we're, we're photographers. We don't have to be identified always by our gender or not, something else. We, we are photographers, that is our chosen identifier. Yeah. But with these images, I do think there is a particular interest or issue because of gender. Here's a, a corollary to that question though is, do you think that these three people I'm not even going to identify them as women just because I don't know that that's how they'd want to be seen in this mm -hmm. way, but that these three people wanted to be known as female photographers or women photographers or whether they, whether they would take that mantle or whether they would be offended by it. Well, I don't think, I don't think she gave two shits about being anything. No, well, I don't know, but yeah. Okay. I wonder if Francesca Woodman was pushing any kind of feminist envelope with this. Or like, feminist agenda in any way. Uh -huh, I, and, and again, truthfully, I don't, I don't know. But I wonder about it. That's all I can do, isn't it? And, and maybe that's something for anybody, anybody who's ever feeling self-conscious about what they do or don't know or what they think they've been educated about or not. The fact is that maybe it's okay just to wonder. Yep. To, to wonder about it.
I think again, you know, in the in the seventies, there was an emergence. Again, is it, perhaps it is a dreadful term. It shouldn't be, but it is because it has to be the term. An emergence of female artists. Sure. It doesn't mean that there were no female artists. It means there was an emergence publicly of them. They were allowed suddenly. Um, I think Sherman is a pioneer. Yeah. Or, you know, Cameron was a pioneer. Sherman just was able to break through a hundred years later. Well, quite. But as an artist also, you know, taking um, values that traditionally would have been seen in a fine art context uh, and in perhaps dif different visual art contexts more broadly, you know, she's bringing an entirely new, for the time, an entirely new um, idea, I suppose, into a public domain. Here's, here's a woman who's disguised as a woman, <laughs> hidden in plain sight. Mm, hidden in plain sight, there we go, another one. All of these women are hidden in plain sight. Do you feel like you are hidden in plain sight? Do you feel like you're, you're, you're femaleness is, 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 is a cloak in society in some way? I have often wondered if in my inner world there is any gender at all. That's the only way I know how to answer that yeah. without spending another hour. And do, back do you, at you, Bill, you know, are you bandying about your maleness? I mean, I think that I am in many, in many ways, I am not in any way a stereotypical male. In some ways I am but I don't think about the fact that I'm a man all that often, but maybe that has to do with the fact that I'm a man in today's society and therefore mm -hmm. like I'm the default anyway, or it could just be that like, I really don't think about it that way, you know, like I don't, but also don't this think is I'm maybe, better because I'm a man or anything like that. But maybe you know? this is the dividing line sometimes between what is and what is, well, I'm not trying to be too obscure, but you know, how you see yourself, how relevant is that compared to how everybody else sees you? Yeah, do, do people take me more or less seriously because of what I am or who I am? I think it's a double-edged, I think everything's a double-edged sword. Of you know? course, and again, that's coming back to the point about it's okay just to wonder. We don't have to have any categorical answers about any of this. The fact is that oh, we- Oh, see oops. Sandy wins today. <laughs> well, I do like to get that shoehorned in there if it's possible. <laughs> Yeah. I could have named this a million times over, you know. We've not actually really addressed the issue in in the way that, in the way that we could have and also this conversation is is in itself again quite uh you know, we've not stuck to necessarily the topic. As we normally do. Oh uh, yeah, I do love that. Almost straight out the out the gate, you were saying, should we identify this as women photographers? And, and that that's my takeaway from this. You know, still to think further about. Do I think when I think of Eve Arnold, or Dorothea Lange, am I thinking about women photographers, or am I just thinking about photographers? Yeah. I mean, I think that ultimately, while there are all kinds of distinctions and things within society, whether it's 
gender or race or ageism or you know any any way you want to slice and dice humanity i think that the end state of some idealized equality is that it doesn't matter any of these things right you know what i mean that they they are not rich or poor like these that the or where, nationality that like ultimately we need to get to the point where none of these things really matter in any anything other than a descriptive nature yeah. um even even if that and so any way, anytime people slice and dice people and people will attack me for saying this because I'm a white man from America, right? Like, of course you can say that because you're at the top of a giant pyramid of idealism or whatever. But like, but I think the, 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 the more that we break things up into categories, I think the, the longer it's going to take us to get to that end result. Um, and I think sometimes it's transitory period where it's like, well, right now we're thinking about this in this sliced up way in order to shine a light on things that haven't been seen in a long time, which I understand. But in the end, I don't think that that gets us any closer to true equality. Um, I think it is, it is right. Taking it's work for what it is, is, is what we need to start doing. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. but that's, that's perhaps accounting for taking things as of today in yep. 2021 when these photographs are made even in the 70s which for us is still is still our lifetime <laughs> you sure. know we have to remember that culture didn't always allow it didn't allow for the same expected oh, absolutely equalitarianism yeah. and, and so there there is cause to name it there is still cause to name it. I was alive in 1977. I was alive when this picture was taken. I was a little two-year-old, cute little kid. Okay, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you. Thank you, I Sandy. That was fun. I really missed talking to you last week, so hopefully it won't be so long until our next one. Hopefully I won't get work that'll cause me to travel anymore so we can make sure we do this show every Thursday. <laughs> Bye, Bill. Bye, Sandy.